The Democracy Forum is a not-for-profit organization founded in 2009 under the patronage of Baroness Nicholson of Winterbourne. Its principal goal was to work for the furtherance of democracy, peace and the rule of law in order to counter religious fundamentalism and intolerance in our global communities. In an increasingly fractured world, this goal continues to be the driving force behind all of the Forum's activities. Lord Charles Bruce is the current president of the Forum. Since its inception, the Forum has hosted and co-hosted seminars on a wide variety of topics relating to democracy and human rights across the world. The Democracy Forum encourages academics, students, journalists and other socially and politically conscious people to attend our seminars and to participate in the question and answer session. Details are available on our website, thedemocracyforumlimited.com. Myanmar coup. A blow to democracy. Myanmar is in turmoil. On February 1, 2021, the army seized power in a coup d'etat. The move has reinstated full military rule, following 10 years of quasi-democracy. The people of Myanmar took to the streets in protest. But their initially peaceful demonstrations were met by escalating military violence, leaving hundreds dead and thousands injured. Please join us with your questions and opinions on this emotive theme. Hello, welcome. I'm Humphrey Hawksley, your moderator and host for this timely and very important Democracy Forum seminar. Myanmar coup, a blow to democracy, and what a dreadful blow it has been, with hundreds dead, thousands detained, horrible stories of cruelty, and yet only 10 years ago, Myanmar's future was capturing a global imagination. There's a crucial meeting this weekend of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, but does ASEAN have any muscle, any will for something like this, of its policy of non-interference in domestic issues of its members? We have on the panel Thin Lei Win, Dr. Maung Zani, Dr. David Bremer, Dr. Mona Adhikari, and Baroness Mary Gaudi. But before hearing from them, I'm going to ask the president of the Democracy Forum, Lord Charles Bruce, to set the scene for our debate. Lord Bruce, the screen is yours. On behalf of the Democracy Forum, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to everyone who's decided to follow the webinar this afternoon, which we have convened in order to derive a clearer understanding of the nature of the crisis which is gripping Myanmar. I'm delighted that at relatively short notice, we've been able to assemble a panel of experts whose collective knowledge of Myanmar and the geopolitics of South Asia undoubtedly will provide you with the requisite insight. And I'm very pleased to acknowledge that Humphrey Hawksley has agreed to chair the panel again and to moderate the proceedings today. Alongside other seasoned observers of the uneasy path to democracy that has long beset Myanmar, the Democracy Forum and its sister publication, Asian Affairs Magazine, have been watching closely how events have unfolded following the military detention of President Yuen Min and State Chancellor Aung San Suu Kyi, other lawmakers and government officials on the 1st of February. An article written by Nicholas Nugent for our March edition suggests that the military rationale 
to overturn the results of last November's election was not entirely unexpected. This is the fifth resumption of military power since 1962. Ominously, he suggests that one certain prediction in an uncertain scenario is that the Tamador will have difficulty enforcing its rule unless it takes firm action. Since then, the escalating scale of military repression has resulted in the arrest of a further 2,700 individuals and is reckoned to have claimed over 750 lives. Writing in the Financial Times at the end of last week, the British diplomat Andrew Hein, who was appointed as United Kingdom ambassador to Myanmar in 2009, expressed his worry about the determination of General Min Ang Han and his military junta to compound their egregious error of judgment. Although Myanmar's generals are ruthless at suppressing dissent, he writes, they are politically naive, secretive, and inward looking. Isolated from reality in their remote capital, they seem to have miscalculated reactions at home and abroad. Indeed, the sheer horror of how demonstrations of unarmed protesters have been met with brute force is curiously reminiscent of the darkest moments of European colonial rule in South Asia. Only last week, we remembered the 102nd anniversary of the Jallianwalaba massacre in Amritsar when British Indian troops under the command of Brigadier General Reginald Dyer in the space of 10 minutes shot dead over 370 unarmed civilians. Following this appalling episode, the Bengali poet and nationalist figure Rabindranath Tagore wrote that the event in Amritsar has, with a rude shock, revealed to our minds the helplessness of our position. And considering that such treatment has been meted out to a population disarmed and resourceless by a power that has the most terribly efficient organization for destruction of human lives, we must strongly assert that it can claim no political expediency, far less moral justification. And in another colonial coincidence, next year marks the centenary of the writer George Orwell's arrival in Burma to assume the post of an imperial police officer. It's chilling to recognize in his last major work of literature, 1984, which was published in the year Burma was granted independence, an almost exact photo fit prediction of why General Min Ong Han reacted in February and how he intends to recover control of Myanmar. Orwell wrote, always there will be the intoxication of power constantly increasing. If you want a picture of the future, imagine a boot stamping on a human face forever. But I'm hopeful that our panelists today will be able to raise our expectations that Myanmar's military apparatus of state oppression will not prevail, whatever form it takes. The exiled writer, Mong Zani, who is speaking on our panel today, suggests that his compatriots now need to take the opportunity to lay the foundations for a confident and representative civil society as the first stage of creating a democratic state. And he has a warning for General Min Aung Han. He writes, historical amnesia might be a trademark for some people, but the Burmese are a historically conscious lot. The generations who survived the first period of military rule with a civilian mask have a saying, we have been dead once, and we know the price of a coffin. Only last week, the veteran activist Minko Nan announced the formation of the National Unity Government 
an internal government in exile, which has already gained legitimacy by including representatives of Myanmar's ethnic minority groups in senior roles and embracing a federal democracy charter. The new government intends to marshal local and international support for the restoration of democracy. International recognition will be critical. The first important regional test of how the national unity government is convened will occur on Saturday when a special summit will be held in Jakarta by ASEAN member countries addressing the Myanmar crisis. And although she is under detention and may face charges relating to trumped up electoral offences, Aung San Suu Kyi has left the world in no doubt of her vision for a free and democratic Myanmar. In her closing statement to the International Court of Justice in December 2019, she said, since Myanmar gained independence in 1948, our people have not known the security of sustainable development. Our greatest challenge is to address the roots of distrust and fear, prejudice and hate that undermine the foundations of our union. We shall adhere to our commitment to nonviolence, human rights, national reconciliation and rule of law as we go forward to build the democratic federal union to which our people have aspired for generations past. But I do hope you enjoy the webinar today and please feel free to engage in the discussion and to direct your questions to the panel. Is for our technical hitch at the beginning, but, but a, a very good grounding for us, showing us the unpleasant, sometimes unpalatable cycles of history of violence and repression that's having, and then giving us a, an idea of the networks of hope that might be being set up now. Our panelists will each speak for 10 minutes, then we will have a question and answer, after which we hope Barry Gardner, Member of Parliament, former Government Minister, a man highly knowledgeable on Asian affairs and chair of the Democracy Forum, will sum up the debate and offer his conclusions. I say hope because Barry has a parliamentary appointment at three o'clock, and I hope that he is back in time to give us his thoughts. We also asked the Myanmar Embassy if they wanted to join us, but as many of you may know, they had their own internal coup with the ambassador being locked out by the military attaché, and unsurprisingly, they haven't got back to us. And as Lord Bruce said, please challenge us, question us, insist on clarity. Use the chat box and I will feed in your views and get answers and the comments and questions will also appear up on the screen. Now, first up, uh, the founder and former chief correspondent of Myanmar Now news agency, Thin Le Win. Uh, she's going to bring us up to date on what's happening in Myanmar today. The arrests, the killings, and specifically the muzzled press and media freedom. Uh, where does Myanmar's media, indeed, where does Myanmar go from here? And despite the ongoing tragedy, is there reason for hope? Thin, the screen is yours. Thank you very much, Humphrey. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. You are unmuted. Great. Thank you to the Democracy Forum and Lord Bruce for having me today. Um, it, it's been a very difficult few weeks for anyone who cares about Myanmar. Um, Lord Bruce just now talked about more than 700 people being killed by the hunter. I just want to highlight that that includes dozens of children, including a six-year-old. Now, many more people have been injured, including a one-year-old baby who was hit by a rubble bullet while playing. More than 3,200 people have been detained. And the violence have been indiscriminate, vicious, and for the most part, very, very one-sided, coming from the military, from the police, uh, from the forces that are supposed to be protecting the citizens, but instead turning their guns and weapons on their own people. 
Now, I want to focus a little bit on the coup's impact on journalism and the media, um, because it's a sector that I happen to know well, and also because it has been very very much affected by the latest developments. Now, journalism has always been a dangerous profession in Myanmar. Neither the junta nor, I might add, uh, the democratically elected government um, have supported or defended, defended independent journalism, um, particularly ones that, you know, challenge the established narratives. But the stakes are just so much higher now. If you are a journalist, you are a target. Now, according to the United Nations, at least 71 journalists have been arrested since the coup on 1st of February. And according to the AAPBB, which is a, an independent monitoring group that has been you know, recording um, instances of detention and political imprisonment, um, more than half of these 71 journalists that have been arrested are still in detention. And that includes at least two of my friends. Many people have been charged under the Penal Code 505A, which is a new section that the coup regime has introduced. Um, and what it does essentially is it makes it illegal to cause fear, spread false news and agitate directly or indirectly against a government employee. It's almost a catch all section and it carries a potential prison term of three years. Now, hundreds of people celebrities, ordinary people, as well as 19 journalists have been named in the list of people who are wanted for violating the same law. Now, the Hunter has also revoked the licenses of five independent media outlets. That includes Myanmar Now, the investigative news agency that I founded in 2015. It is currently being managed and run solely by a tremendously talented and courageous team of local reporters. The Hunter has also raided the offices of many media outlets. And just last week, they arrested three journalists from Michina Journal in Kachin State, which is in the country's north. Now, apparently, since their arrest, these three journalists have been detained in the military interrogation center, and they've not been allowed to meet their family members. Many more journalists are in hiding, so many are also have not slept in their homes since the coup. Now, the junta has not only made it harder for journalists to do their jobs, but they've also made it extremely difficult for ordinary people in Myanmar to access news. They've suspended access to local and international news networks. They've blocked many websites as well as social media channels. And they've also warned the journalists not to refer to the junta as the junta or the coup as a coup. They've also imposed nightly internet shutdowns, now for 65 nights in a row. Mobile data has been di disabled for more than a month. Wireless broadband has been cut now for 18 days. Now this has left only fiber optics connection, which is available for in only you know a fraction of households in the whole of Myanmar, in the wealthiest families or offices. In the, in, in, you know, in the space of less than three months, Myanmar military has dragged the country back by decades. Now, I'm not saying that everything was perfect before the 1st of February. Like I said earlier, the democratically elected government, the NLD-led government, wasn't a big defender of press feeder, freedom of independent journalism either. Between 2016 and 2020, when the NLD was in power, many media outlets and journalists faced arrests threats, lawsuits, and in the worst cases, attempts to their lives. But unfortunately, the situation has worsened dramatically. But the local media has stepped up to the challenge. Despite the dangers, journalists are still working. And a whole new generation of citizen journalists, ordinary people with mobile phones, have appeared, have appeared to fill this gap left by the arrest of journalists. Now, I'd actually expected that, that the news coming out of Myanmar would drop off, the amount of news would drop off quite, quite dramatically when broadband Wi-Fi internet was cut off. But that has not happened. Yes, it has become much more difficult to contact people. But every day we receive images, videos and news of events across the country, thanks to both ordinary people, as well as journalists who are risking their lives to keep us informed. 
Now, if there is a silver lining or three among all this horror, one is that the creativity of the young generation remains undimmed. Just in the last few weeks, we've seen at least five new political journals appeared and they're now being printed. Um, and a pirate radio station called Federal FM. They've appeared to counter the internet shutdowns as well as to counter the hunter's propaganda. Now, the other silver lining is that people are finally seeing the value of independent media. Over the last few years, especially in the wake of the Rohingya genocide, a lot of people in Myanmar were quite hostile towards both international and local media because they felt the coverage was unfair or untrue. And any journalist, you know, showing sympathy uh, towards the Rohingya or even some of the minority ethnic groups were accused of being biased. The situation now, as difficult as it is, has been really heartening to see people recognizing the role of free independent media. And in the same vein, there's been a massive transformation that's taking place within Myanmar society. Now, a small but growing and quickly growing number of Burma Buddhists, and this is the majority ethnic group to which I belong as well, they're recognizing the decades long struggles and oppressions that the minority ethnic groups have faced. Now, there's a fair bit of belated but crucial soul searching going on. Many are apologizing to the minority ethnic groups, including the Rohingya, for their failure to speak out and for not believing them earlier. Yes, there's a long way to go, and I am under no illusions as to the kind of work it's going to take to undo decades of propaganda and divide and rule strategy. But I do feel the need to point out that while most of what is happening in Myanmar is truly awful, we are also seeing the potential of what Myanmar could be if it was allowed to restart. So what can the international community do? Well, quite a bit. And when I say international community, I'm not just talking about the UN or ASEAN or governments. I'm talking about the Burmese diaspora or even ordinary citizens across the world, including those in the UK. If you can, if all you can do is spare a bit of time, then please stay engaged with what is happening in Myanmar. Please talk about it. Please educate others who might not know about it or not be aware of what's happening. Now, if you can afford to make donations, please consider supporting people who are taking part in the civil disobedience movement or the local media. And I'm happy to give you know, the exact names and details later on if there's any interest. And if you have any institutional backing, please consider providing practical support to media outlets in Myanmar who are going to need all the help they can get from providing salaries to giving them burner phones so that they can have secure communications or even helping them start offices outside of the country because we are looking at the prospect of having exiled media once again. Um, thank you very much, Humphrey. Back to you. So that was so totally fascinating. And I just wanted to sort of get get a picture from you because you weren't exactly complimentary about the the pre the NLD's regime there when it comes to journalists. Just give us an idea now of what people in Myanmar are hearing from the state controlled media now than they were hearing before when there was a sort of more democratic regime in and what the conditions are, because you were talking about arrests and, and threats of being killed. Give us, give us a balance. What's it like to be a journalist under the, the coup regime and what was it like to be a journalist uh, previously? Sure. So I'll just very briefly perhaps give you two quick examples. So when I, you know, when I said the NLD uh, led government wasn't very friendly towards journalists. So one, you know, um, in fact, both cases um, relate to my former workplaces. So one is the case of two righteous journalists, Walone and Josu Wu, um, who um, exposed the atrocities committed by the Tamador against the Rohingya Muslims, in particular, a massacre of 10 Muslim, uh, 10 Rohingya men and, and, and boys. They were charged, and arrested, charged and convicted of violating the Official Secrets Act and spent you know, 
more than 500 days in prison uh, before they were being released under an amnesty. This happened in Dezem from December 2017 to May 2019 under the NLD government. And Doan San Suu Kyi herself actually defended their conviction. Um, the other case is of my former colleague Sui Win, who is now managing and leading Yama now. Um, he, you know, a, a supporter of this hardline Buddhist monk called Viratu, who I think many of you may have heard, um, uh, filed a um, criminal defamation case against Sui Win um, based on a Facebook post. And for two years, he had to travel 600 kilometers, more than 600 kilometers from his home in Yangon to Mandalay to attend court hearings, uh, whereas the prosecution, including Buratu, didn't turn up. Again, this happened under the NLD's watch. Um, so that's what I meant by the fact that the NLD themselves weren't big defenders. Now, having said that, you know, we still had the space, the freedom to report them. Um, we could still identify ourselves as journalists, um, call people now with at least five outlets being, um, their licenses being revoked. You know, you are illegal. If you identify yourself as a journalist from Mizima, if you identify yourself as a journalist from, you know, Kids That Media, who are also some of the media, that, you know, you are working for an illegal organization. So journalists are, are you know, under threat of arrest and detention just if, if, if they are seen as belonging to these media outlets. And of course, yeah. as we know, once you're detained, um, we've heard lots of stories of torture and, yeah. and, and really harrowing yeah, experiences. Yeah. So it, 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 it's really bad now, but it wasn't a bed of roses before. Uh, and the so-called what we thought in the West was a sort of shift towards democracy wasn't exactly when you're working on the ground, you had to watch out and be situationally aware of what lines to cross and not to cross. One last question that's come in for you to answer before we move on is uh, who, who can enter Myanmar now? Can journalists go back? What is the visa situation there? This is from Aung Lau. Well, as far as I know, um, the only journalists that um, on, only foreign journalists or people carrying foreign passport that have, you know, been in 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 Myanmar um, are the, the you know the CNN crew and from uh, the Southeast yeah. Asia Globe who had gone in um, uh, through the you know uh, I think um, the the lobbyist has arranged their trip. That's the only two that I know. Obviously, if you have a Myanmar passport, you can go back. Um, I think, as far as I know. But if you are a journalist with a Myanmar passport, I'm not sure you want to be going back in at this particular point yeah. in time. I certainly don't. Yeah, you wouldn't You wouldn't go back at the moment because you would be picked up and arrested and, and, and go through all those horrors. Thank you very much for that. I'm sure we're going to come back to you on more, th more elements of what you've experienced there because we also want to talk about what the international community is doing, the role of Aung San Suu Kyi, and, and there's a lot of uh, material that we're trying to get through. But now I'm going to Dr. Maung Zani, who's founder of the Free Burma Coalition, a visiting fellow at the London School of Economics. And, and Dr. Zani is going to take us inside the minds of the military regime. And that's, that's a big task, known as the Tadmador. What do they want? what and who made them what they are historically, and why are they so afraid of democracy? Dr. Zani, over to you. Thank you, Humphrey, and uh, thank you to uh, Lord Bruce and all the organizers. Um, Honored to be on this um, distinguished um, event uh, panel. Um, well, what, what do the Tamado or military want? They want a permanent um, control over the political economy, essentially power and um, vast economic enterprises. And they want to have a, a control over vast territories and control over the populations with very diverse ethnic and religious backgrounds. But I want to take a step back from where we are today to <clears throat> the origin of the crisis. Firstly, you know, the DNA of the Tamado or the armed forces was fascist through and through. It was founded as a nationalist proxy 
by the Japanese Naval Intelligence in 1942 with Aung San Suu Kyi's father as the nationalist proxy that would do the Japanese bidding against um, you know, British rule. But Aung San entered into this marriage of convenience with the fascists in order to end the British colonial rule. But we ended up <clears throat> with an uh, armed forces that retained both colonial and uh, fascist characteristics. Um, in the initial period after the British re-entered Burma, uh, as victors and as you know, collaborators with the nationalists, Burmese to drive out the Japanese occupiers. Um, Aung San attempted to move this armed forces towards a professional army befitting a democracy. Aung San was not a fascist uh, ideologically, nor was he a dictator. He was actually a, a you know Marxist-inspired revolutionary with a democratic leanings. So in 1945-46, in Kandy, he was in negotiations with Lord Mountbatten. Uh, Mountbatten told him, if you want to lead national politics for liberation of your country, you must step down as the head of the Burma um, Defense or Independence Army. And you play the uh, uh, purely political role and keep the uh, armed forces um, as a, you know, subservient but valuable national institution under civilian control. Aung San, you know, happily complied. And after his assassination in 1947, July, the reigns of the uh, this British reformed uh, national armed forces were in the hands of a Sandhurst-educated, ethnically Kran general named Smithdorn. And then within one year of his reign, the Kran ethnic revolution took place. And the Burmese nationalist politicians who felt that uh, the ethnic background of the armed forces chief, Smithdorn, could be problematic uh, for a new Burma. So out of that racist, I would say racist, uh, Burmese nationalist concern, Smith Dorn was replaced with General Nguyen in February 1949. That is actually the date I would use as the, the date that Burma had been placed on this, you know, dictatorial path. Because unlike Aung San, Nguyen was given a special training um, equivalent to SS training at the um, Imperial Academy to train Kim Pei Tai. Kim Pei Tai was the instrument of genocide in Manchuria and much of uh, Southeast Asia and Far East. And Ne Win was, um, you know, graduate of that the Kim Pei Tai fascist institution. So from 1949 to 1988, when he officially resigned from the head of state position, Nguyen single-handedly shaped this institution along the only military lines that he was so familiar with, which was uh, Kim Pei Tai. Kim Pei Tai was disbanded after Tokyo Tribunal, um, after the surrender of the Japanese in 1945. Uh, but the Burmese military continues on with Kim Pei Tai tra tradition. So the institution today we have has retained elements of the past that are completely unsuited to any political system that strives towards a you know, semblance of functioning democratic governance. You know, the Burmese military, if you look at the institution closely, you will find different elements, Fe uh, feudalism, you know, I would say neo-feudalism, because the regional commanders and commanders of the Burmese army have absolute control over the territory economically and otherwise. It, you know, the regional commands are like fiefdoms. They can do what they want to the population, produce lucrative uh, businesses and everything. So, and then because of this economic dimension, the another 
aspect of Burmese military needs to be noted. That is mafia-like, uh, you know, institution. As you know, a vast, you know, portion of the Burmese national economy is controlled through two military conglomerates, you know, Myanmar Economic Corporations and Myanmar Economic Holding Limited. And they control you know, extremely lucrative natural resource extractive cent, uh, sector, public transportation, uh, telecommunications, and all the way uh, down to retail and department stores. And there's another element that we should also look at. The Burmese nationalism retain a very extreme and fascist-like characteristics. So that's why what we are seeing today is not simply a military coup junta using excessive force in their attempts at riot control. What we are seeing is a Nazi-like occupation of the entire 54 million population of different races and faiths and political backgrounds. That is why what we are seeing is an unprecedented but textbook example of a, a social revolution. You know, we then rightly noted the creativity of new generation and their determination to fight back uh, peacefully or with whatever, um, you know, they can uh, mobilize in terms of self-defense and defense of communities. There are also other sectors of Burmese society, private sectors, you know, like department stores, shops, they stop carrying anything the military produces, like Nyama Bia, yeah? uh, or anything that has to do with uh, uh, the military. Also, communities have excommunicated, you know, or ostracized the, um, the Burmese military in a way that has never happened in the uh, in the history of our country. And the, also the, the communities across the country have instrumentalized culture and uh, cultural festivities to express their total opposition against the military rule. Water festival, for instance, is, um, is something that everyone, you know, irrespective of race or faith, participates in. You know, it, nowhere, in no period in the Burmese history has the Burmese society ever stopped celebrating this New Year festival by throwing uh, water uh, at uh, neighbors and friends and strangers who partake in this uh, festival. And then finally, th there's another um, element to this. Because Burma is a multi-ethnic community with a different um, ethnic communities with different political history, linguistic history, political, uh, you know, cultural um, customs, with their distinctive pockets of ancestral land dotting, you know, all the borderland areas. Because of this multi-ethnic nature of Burmese society as a whole, the military has been you know, long before the uh, the coup, long before the the first coup of 1962, the military has been seen by non-Burmese and non-Buddhist communities as a colonial occupier. So on one hand, you have Burmese ethnically controlled Burmese national armed forces oppressing the Burmese majority over the last 58 years. And then on the other hand, you've got Burmese ethnic controlled military occupying the ethnic regions across Burma, minor, national minorities. So you've got a very complex situation here. What has developed is not simply what political scientists and other scholars call state within the state. What we are seeing is also a society within the society. The military is a social ecocosm on its own. It has its own, you know, social set of social relations. The, uh, the uh, top generals and their family members 
are closely connected with cronies and a lot of them uh, ethnic Chinese uh, tycoons. The intermarriages, you know, between the uh, uh, extremely rich Chinese, not majority of Chinese Burmese um, that are very well integrated into the Burmese society, but a handful of a handful, but very influential and wealthy Chinese families and the Burmese uh, generals and their ch children. They have uh, built this web of, you know, inter-family, um, what you call it, uh, ties. And through these inter-family ties with the Chinese tycoons, the Burmese military leaders and their families have been able to tap into Southeast Asia's you know, network of Chinese in banking, shipping, and others. So that's how they stash their wealth. So there is a mafia-like aspect. And finally, the mindset. Well, I think that the mindsets are you know, the product of institutional practices. And we have heard so much uh, you know, uh, stress on one particular general, the commander-in-chief may lie. From my perspective, as a long-time um, a researcher of military affairs and also a former um, military academy admit at the age of uh, 16. Um, I can tell you, whoever the generals, whatever the general's name, as long as this institution remains totally loyal to its own institutional interests, and the interest of the commander in chief and a handful of top brass, this institution will remain the instrument of terror and exploitation. So what we are seeing today, my last comment, is a country under terroristic siege. If you look at the conduct of the Burmese military, you know, they have not killed more than 1,000 people, whereas the military coup in 1988 resulted in about, you know, the 3,000 deaths because they're using snipers. So violence is surgically used with the sole purpose of terrorizing the institute, the entire society to accept the political setup that suits the military and that perpetuates the military's rule. So we have today the entire society coming together across ethnic, religious and class lines against this institution. There is no possibility in so far as the public mood in the country of reconciliation between these two institutions. On one hand, 300 or 400,000 strong, heavily armed uh, military institution that has morphed into a terroristic mafia-like institution and 54 million people on the other hand. And that is the scenario. And this is uh, going to get worse. Bef uh, you know, I don't know whether things are going to get uh, better, but things are definitely going to get worse because the society is no longer prepared to be put back under the boot. Uh, I'll stop there. You are muted, sir. I'm muted for some. Uh, to see, I'm doing it as well. But thank you very much for, for that, because that was a, a you know realistic but depressing outlook. I, I just like to ask you to clarify one thing for all of us: the position on all this with Aung San Suu Kyi, because you very skillfully brought us through the Japanese creation, uh, her father's role, uh, the ethnic role in all that, and then we all know. The, the disappointment among Western democracies uh, over the Rohingya issue. And, and, and we just heard from Finn that actually under the NLD, being a journalist wasn't that great either. So where does she stand in all this? How supportive is she or was she of the Tadmador? How much did she think that reform was possible? Well, you know what, Aung San Suu Kyi, I must say, had been a major part of this problem because she approached the institutional issue as if it were a personal issue. She framed the military as my father's armed forces, yeah, ignoring you know the uh, 50 years of atrocities and the changed nature uh, or, or orientation of this institution in the hands of General Nguyen, 
who essentially in uh, you know inherited this from um, her father uh, through General Smithdorn, uh, the uh, professional um, general, and she called the um, uh, the the soldiers, you know, my father's son. So therefore. They, you know, I have genuine affection for her. When she was in UK, um, you know, she was on, a, I think, like this BBC uh, flagship program uh, on, uh, on Radio 4, uh, mm. Desert Island, yeah? and yep. uh, um, Desert Island Discs, yes. Yes, she, yes. She... And, and, and there she spoke about this institution and the generals. After the the fact came to light that they had been com commending the troops to commit rape and mass atrocities against different minorities and she answered uh, the uh, the the radio host a question how do you feel about them like you know the world thinks that they are rapists and criminals and all that she she spoke with a chuckle and say well you know if you love somebody you have to love them unconditionally not because of but in spite of who they are and what they have done and so that personal approach totally backfired her because we are dealing with an institution and institutional power and she are, she is approaching as if she were simply trying to complete the unfinished unfinished business of our father's democratization project so, so, therein lies a major problem uh, can I just clarify on that? So her, when we, the, the Western democracies were taken by surprise when she failed to, to, to support the Rohingya and that surprise still continues and the governments felt let down by it. Was her loyalty, was it an ethnic Burma, ethnic um, thing or was it a loyalty to, to the military that she wants to reform? Uh, so did we complete, we, I say Western democracy, did we completely misread the situation? The world completely misread Aung San Suu Kyi herself. Yeah? And when she came to uh, LSE in um, June 2012, it's like a 67th birthday of hers. You know, um, I share a panel with her on this issue and also on the broader issue of rule of law in Burma. And I slip her a note saying, Auntie, you cannot work with these guys. And because she refused to answer uh, the Rohingya question, I was assigned to address the question. But the problem here is, uh, Humphrey, is as early as late 1970s. This is something that nobody wants to hear. Aung San Suu Kyi was identified as a racist in a letter written by Lord Goldbooth. Many of you would know. He was a very, you know, he was a foster father to Suu Kyi uh, when he was uh, Secretary of State for India, uh, you know, for Britain. Yeah, uh, the, sh the Lord the Goldbooth family um, assisted her to come to UK and study at Oxford, and she would spend uh, Christmases and holidays with uh, with his family. Lord Goldbooth wrote in 1975 when there were disturbances, a protest in in uh, in Yango and also in Shan State. Uh, you know, Go uh, Lord Booth. Dentif essentially wrote to the uh, foreign secretary saying okay. Suu Kyi was anti-Shan and she okay. she shares this ideological space with uh, the Burmese military. They sing from the same nationalist racist hymn book vis-a-vis okay. -vis the rest of the communities. Right. That's thank you so much for that. And I'm sure we'll get some comments, questions on, on that issue because it's absolutely intrinsic as to what is what is going on in, in Myanmar. And we're going to expand this now uh, into this idea of ethnicity because of the many insurgencies that are in Myanmar unresolved. And from the School of Global Studies, the University of Sussex, Dr. David Brenner, who knows about Myanmar's many violent ethnic conflicts. Two years ago, he published Myanmar's Borderlands, where he investigated the Kachin and Karen rebellions. Uh, Dr. Brenner is now hopefully going to tell us how this ethnic politics that we've been discussing is behind so much of what is unfolding in Myanmar. Dr. Brenner.
Thanks very much, Humphrey. Um, thanks for um, inviting me. Thanks also to Lord Bruce and the Democracy Forum for inviting me again. Three years ago, I've uh, talked uh, uh, at the forum about the persistent power and sources of profit of the military that Dr. Maung Sani um, so masterfully also um, described and analyzed for us just now. It's quite sad to be talking um, well under the context that this is indeed not just persisting, but how this has taken the country on another really brutal twist in its uh, long history. My intervention today um, might first seem a little contentious, maybe, especially in a forum called the Democracy Forum, because I will argue that the primary lens of democracy and democratization with which we have long understood the struggle in Myanmar might not be actually the most useful lenses for understanding what is going on, how we got here and how to find solutions to the persistent military authoritarianism that we see um, what Dr. Maunzani described as the state within the state. Um, instead, I believe that we need to pay much closer attention to the ethnic politics and the ethno-national conflict that has um, basically uh, taken grip of um, the country, the state, society since, um, uh, well, independence and even before under British colonial rule. And we should do so not just as a second order reality, but as the main crux of persistent violence today and uh, the persistent military power. And indeed, I also um, uh, suggest that this might explain again how the word misread on Sun Tzu Chi, what Dr. Manzani was just explaining and discussing. So let's start. On 1st of February 2021, where there was a coup, the BBC reported that Myanmar's generals seized power in a military coup. We are now at a point where media all around reports that Myanmar is descending into civil war. Well, of course, the military has staged a coup um, on the 1st of February and ousted a democratically elected government. And of course, the brutal military crackdown on protesters and strikes have unleashed violence across Myanmar that is of a new quality. But that said, the narratives of militaries seizing power and the country descending into civil war are analytically incorrect because the military has retained sizable amount of power throughout the last decade of transition, which in itself was, of course, initiated by the military. And also, Myanmar has witnessed the world's longest ongoing civil war ever since its independence and even before. Um, so these kind of uh, well analytics here kind of show that we might have to find some different means of looking at the country and what's going on now. Well, I believe for better understanding, we have to actually also rethink yeah, um, international engagement um, or also the, for better understanding international engagement that we can address what has been going on in Myanmar, Myanmar we have to rethink that lens. That lens is basically constituted as the International Crisis Group has evaluated on the day of the coup um, as the lens of democratization. The International Crisis Group was saying that there was a traumatic turn of events constituting an immense setback for democracy in Myanmar. Um, the newly then inaugurated US President Joe Biden vowed that the US will work with our partners throughout the region and the world to support the restoration of democracy in Myanmar. But critical commentators from Myanmar's ethnic nationality community, so these are the ethnic minority communities who constitute about 40% of the country um, and prefer to be called ethnic nationality communities, they in particular voiced the rejection of a return to the status quo ante and demanded for more than a reinstitution of democracy. So for instance, uh, Josian Lying, who is a young Arakanese journalist and scholar, made this clear in a commentary for Frontier Myanmar titled, Myanmar politics must be remade, not restored. He and others highlighted indeed that Myanmar's decade of democratization after all have brought further, sometimes even escalating, disenfranchisement, displacement and death for many non bamar communities across the country. And my intervention highlights these critical voices for scrutinizing this dominant lens, which basically narrates Myanmar's troubled politics through that struggle of democracy and the kind of civil military relations. In this narration, these kind of constituent categories of liberal political theory, so democracy, civil military relations, take analytical and causal precedence over others, such as ethnic identities, ethnic conflict, nationalism. Um, but I think that we have to really focus on those. Um, uh, and that is not only 
um, uh, to um, understand the kind of violence and conflict that has gone hand in hand with the democratization, actually. But also, I think, to address the persistent power of the military, because it's so bound up, of course, with the ethno-national conflict. Um, even in, um, I think, before we all joined, we've discussed, or Humphrey was saying, even in this very narrative of the military as the guardian of the nation that kind of sees itself as something that kind of keeps together um, the nation, which quite obviously is anything but true. So why is a focus on ethnic politics important? Um, Vinet, I think we prepared a map, and if you could show that, that would be great, um, because I think it just illustrates yeah, um, some of the complexity that we are talking about. Thank you very much. Um, so basically, here on the map, you see, well, a few of the larger um, ethnic armed organizations that have been fighting against the military in the country for decades. Um, uh, you, it's not completely up to date. That is still one of the best maps I think there is from Burman News International. Um, it doesn't actually show the Arakan army that's been uh, engaged in very heavy fighting with the military in the west of the country on the uh, border of India and Bangladesh, but it shows many of the others nevertheless. And so I think it's maybe quite good to illustrate um, some of what I'm going to talk about now. Because um, many of those ethnic armed organizations who've been fighting for greater autonomy of their communities from the Myanmar military state for decades um, uh, have continued to actually fight throughout the decade of transition. Um, so it's important to um, well, take account of this, not only to appreciate the dire experiences of ethnic minority communities themselves, right? Um, uh, and at the same time, of course, we need to be clear that the past decade of transition has also improved the livelihoods of people, say, though more in the urban spaces like Michina or Pa'an, but certainly not in the rural communities of Kachin State and Shan State, where conflict has escalated, certainly not amongst the Rohingya Muslim community, as well as other Muslim communities across the country. Um, but also, um, uh, these kind of incidences of violence that have actually escalated, increased throughout the transition, yeah, have often seen as some kind of outlier experience throughout that transition process. Yeah? Um, uh, not least because maybe, well, Uthain Sein, the semi-military administration of Uthain Sein, um, uh, was actually able to sign a ceasefire with the country's oldest um, uh, ethnic armed organization, the Karen National Union, which you see on the east of the country here towards Thailand yeah, in, uh, in blue um, uh, at the time of transition. But at the same time, when Myanmar was transitioning, well, um, ceasefires in the north of the country broke down. Very long-standing ceasefires with the Kachin Independence Organization, as well as with other ethnic armed organizations there. But here again, these incidences were kind of taken never that seriously and most emblematic actually in a recent commentary by the European Union High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, uh, Josep Borrell, he was saying um, now in the context of the coup, after 2010, I'm quoting him here, um, a gradual process of democratization led to free elections in 2015, won by the NLD of Dawn Sun Suu Kyi. The democratic transition was accompanied in the same year by ethnic peace. After decades of armed conflict, a nationwide ceasefire agreement was signed in October 2015 between the government and the armed ethnic groups. Um, this was a milestone and demonstrated the strong political will to address long-standing grievances through dialogue and cooperation rather than violence, end quote. But this is <laughs> fundamentally not true. I mean, I've been writing a book about this, but also I think many of my panelists will agree that, of course, um, ethnic peace was nothing that came about from that nationwide ceasefire agreement that was never nationwide, but always only encompassed a few armed groups in the country. Um, so this is though still that dominant narrative that I think is inherently problematic. It's inherently problematic because um, uh, we cannot understand the persistent military power in Myanmar through that narrative. Like Mary Callahan, who's been writing a book on exactly that military power and profit has, of course, long relied on stalking ethnic conflict since independence. This overblown institution of the Tatmadaw with its almost half million soldiers I mean, would not exist without the kind of constant manufacturing of that conflict. 
right? Um, and in the same vein, of course, the transition in 2011 itself, yeah, um, relied on the military to instigate this transition at a time when it felt particularly powerful, when it felt that its opponents in the ethnic armed organizations and opponents in the wider resistance movement in Myanmar um, were fragmented um, to a degree that it could kind of uh, reinsert its power in a more indirect way. Well, and I believe that this perspective of fragmentation you know, um, is actually important you know, for also understanding um, where to go from here, I think. The Spring Revolution is a highly heterogeneous movement, and that's great. Myanmar is a very diverse country, which is beautiful. Um, currently, I think the movement revolves around the um, CRPH, so the NLD-led um, kind of ousted parliament, uh, uh, plus, of course, the um, national unity government now, then the civil disobedience movement, the kind of countrywide civilian resistance movement, um, but also, of course, of the multiple ethnic armed organizations. And there's this kind of alliance formation that is really important to think through um, and to support, um, uh, uh, especially for that revolution to be successful. Um, but here, of course, we've seen the positioning of different ethnic armed organizations in different ways. So what I'm saying here is that not all ethnic armed organizations have, of course, taken um, that direct pro stance for that alliance. We've seen the Karen National Union and the Kachin Independence Organization um, uh, uh, doing this in a very strong way, not just the statements, but also the strong actions um, that, for instance, consisted of offensively attacking military troops close to cities to draw out military troops from the cities, from shooting civilians there, etc. Um, and there's, of course, a lot of explanations why they, rather than maybe some others, as for instance, the United War State Army or the Arakan Army, have have um, uh, taken less of a um, direct supportive role and indeed in some ways have uh, uh, si signed new ceasefires like the Arakan army, for instance, or had uh, further negotiations with the military. But importantly, and I just want to highlight one thing here, very important, of course, is history to explain the fragmented nature and also how to maybe bring that together more because history really shows that what we're witnessing now is not all that new. Like in like the 1990s, of course, the exiled NLD government um, under then the NCTUB, the National Coalition Government of the Union of Burma, fled to the border areas, fled to KNU territories, aligned themselves with different ethnic armed organizations. But since 2012 and certainly since 2015, well, um, many of those ethnic armed organizations have felt to be thrown under the bus, basically by um, uh, the well, NLD administration then that was praising, quote unquote, the valiant efforts of the Tatmadaw um, in the offensives against, eth against ethnic armed organizations, etc. And I'll just stop here by rethinking or urging to rethink yeah, um, how international the international community can also support the formation of this alliance and the coherence of this alliance. Yeah. Um, and how donor support, uh, for instance, can support the kind of progressive forces here rather than fostering even more fragmentation by um, what I think, and we can discuss this in the Q&As, um, what some of the donor support has done in that decade of transition, where donor money was going straight into the hands of militarized bureaucracies, fostering fragmentation over coherence in that kind of resistance movement. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you very much, Dr. David Brenner. And as you were talking, I was sort of drawn back into a into a cloud of pessimism because it must be 30 years since I reported on the Rohingyas being uh, expelled on one side of the country and visited the Karens on the other uh, and these 20 plus insurgencies that were going on. Um, and they're still going on, as you rightly pointed out there. Who funds them? You can't fight a war without money. So who is funding these 22 insurgencies? Well, um, the, the financial aspect obviously is mired in a political economy of conflict and war more generally in the country, right? So if you think about some of the major um, sources of funding for the Tatmadaw, for the military, as for instance, jade mining or the narcotics industry as well, yeah, that is, of course, an industry that in many ways um, a lot of different stakeholders have a stake in, uh, timber logging, mining, etc. Um, that is, in a way, of course, the way that the Tatmadaw has tried to keep up a conflict that isn't full out 
full-blown war, but some form of managed political economy of neither war nor peace, where there is no rule of law, where you have all these illicit economies that fund, of course, variety of um, uh, armed actors, but also including the Chinese mafia, of course, yeah. right? But I would really um, urge here to, to think where the funding of many of those groups is, of course, not an end in itself, right? Like groups like the Karen National Union, like the Kachin Independence Organization, they do, of course, have a very political vision behind that is a means to an end in many ways and you can see that the way that they're very close to the local constituents right mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, you know at the same time of course the very complex political economy that dr maung sani was also touching mm -hmm. on in many ways right that of course is in the end also financing a variety of places in that conflict but, right? but, but one other issue from that so, so you've got a sort of network that, that we're hearing about of sort of military mafia uh, black market and all that sort of stuff but when you're transitioning to a democracy with weak institutions uh, very often you, the, the first voting is on, along ethnic lines. So how can you see there to be a full and peaceful transition to democracy when on the first vote it's very likely that you're going to get people going for the Burman vote or the Kachin vote or the Karen vote and, and, and that sort of thing? Is there a way through that? Is there a, a, an intermediate period that perhaps uh, Myanmar was experimenting with and didn't work? Um, there were debates, of course, in the peace process, right, about things like plurinational federalism in terms of, you know, autonomy provisions for different ethnic groups in different ethnic homelands, etc. These debates are hugely important, right, and we've seen similar um, uh, things, for instance, with the Dayton Agreement in Boston. So there are really important conversations to be had. At the same time, of course, right, I don't believe that on the long run, yeah, um, the ethnic container will make for the most progressive um, uh, container of democratic politics in the country and new transformative axes of alliances and so on that have already started to form in the country, of course, will be important. And here just um, to mention, of course, a lot of ethnic minority voters have voted the NLD, right, for a variety yeah. of complex yes. reasons, yeah. but have yeah. supported the NLD. So it's all getting the across those lines, lines, wasn't it? Yes. Exactly, right. And, and uh, the, the, the sad story, of course, is that they felt very much let down, right, mm -hmm. by then, for instance, the escalation of conflict and some of the statements made, um, etc., and, you know, closing humanitarian access under the administration. And, of course, to note that the NLD was in full control of, of the military and, you know, that they had to, like, walk a tightrope there as well. But I'm just saying that, you know, you've seen, of course, that it's not always the immediate fallback line, right? But that is certainly something to be tra addressed and transformed rather to be taken for granted and just be taken forward, right? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. That's that, that's good. I partly asked that question because we're going to broaden out now to, to the to the region and to, to general the idea of, 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 of fragile states and conflict with Kiel University's Dr. Mona Adhikari. Uh, a, scho a scholar specializing in fragile and conflict afflicted states, an, an expert in India and Chinese foreign policy that, that buffer on, on Myanmar and international interventions. Um, uh, Dr. Mona Adhikari is going to outline the regional and global response to the Myanmar coup. Dr. Adhikari. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, David, Finn, and Zaini for setting out the scene. Um, I'll dive in straight um, to um, the international response um, in the post-coup scenario in Myanmar, largely focusing on uh, the nature of regional response. And, um, and here I want to focus largely on Chinese, but also Indian response to, um, to, a, to a degree. So I think one of the most evident and visible aspects of, um, of international response has been an absence of international consensus um, and, re and relatedly an absence of concerted international response to how to engage with the Myanmar junta after the coup. And here a clear divide is, um, is evident between Western states who have chosen to condemn, to critique, as well as slap a range of sanctions, um, while regional actors have preferred some form of continued engagement. And in this drive for continued engagement, we see actors as uh, we see states as diverse as India, China, and Thailand, all of whom share Myanmar's borders, but also Russia, align in their strategy. And um, this divide between regional neighbors and Western states, or what goes by the name international community, has been evident in, of course, multiple instances, um, including calling the coup a coup. So, for instance, Thailand. Um, uh, representatives um, in Thailand called it an internal affair. Um, the Chinese state media called it a cabinet reshuffle. 
And while India called for upholding rule of law, it shied away from calling the coup a coup. Similar, um, similar divides were surfaced in the United Nations Security Council, where um, Russia and China sort of shielded the military and uh, blocked um, a United Nations um, Security Council statement. Um, of course, later a diluted version of the, um, of the, of the statement was floated, but it's very much a diluted, um, diluted stance. Um, similarly, in the Armed Forces Day, uh, a lot of all these countries send their official representatives to attend um, as official representatives when um, the rest of the world was calling for shunning the military in Myanmar. And um, I know Lord Bruce and, um, mentioned um, ASEAN. Um, so of course, there's been a flurry of diplo diplomatic endeavors um, at all stages in ASEAN, um, and they'll be taking up um, on the summit, um, on the next summit, they'll be discussing Myanmar. But of course, they've extended the invitation to Minong Lang. And, um, so there has been a continued engagement and this divide between um, this divide between the Western states and regional states and um, the continued engagement by regional states has meant that while failing uh, both internally and externally, the military has yet to fall. Um, it has also meant that Western in endeavors to sort of seek some form of compliance to democracy, human rights by Western states have been weakened. But I think this divide needs to be looked at from a very broader historical vantage point. And, and I wanted to touch upon some of them, uh, just not only to understand the changes and continuities, but also um, um, what this means for um, the kind of international action, which would uh, kind of the nature of international action that could be um, taken up. So for one, there is a historic precedence of this divide between Western states and regional um, states um, through the mid 1990s to 2001, 2011-2012, um, when the sanctions sort of started loosening up, it was similar, a similar state of affairs at play. There was Western sanctions um, and there was regional engagement. And in fact, it was Western sanctions and the lack of avenues for trade, investment and aid that sort of enabled Myanmar elites to sort of uh, continue to um, and entrench themselves within the regional economies. And not surprisingly, all regional actors were dominant in the wider political um, economy. Um, so th that this also means that why sanctions are very important to deny the tools of repression uh, for the military, it alone is not sufficient. Neither has it been the last time, nor will it be this time. Um, so there's, we need to think beyond sanctions. Sanctions is necessary, but not sufficient. And I think if you if you kind of unravel the history a little bit to look at um, different states, we see that despite a very contested history between China and Myanmar, especially with China's support to firstly the Communist Party of Burma until 1998, but also the various ethnic fronts that it disintegrated into, which have been core irritants. Um, in 1998 and then on after the sanctions, there was some sort of a marriage of convenience that sort of developed within the bilateral relations. Um, and um, Myanmar looked upon China as its um, primary diplomatic ally, its chief economic patron uh, for a wide area of trade, investment, defense aid, as well as, well as protection of the Un United Nations Security Council, especially in the 2000s when it became a Security Council issue. Um, some, uh, a reverse kind of a thing can be uh, seen in India's engagement. So um, in the aftermath of the crackdown of the pro-democracy movement in Myanmar in the late 1980s, India was one of the most vocal opponents to the military junta. But there was a policy reversal in 1993. Um, there are multiple reasons as to why that happened. Um, so one being that there was a serious realization within the policy circles in Delhi that um, this old policy of isolating the military had failed. The military was there to stay and had to be engaged with. This was, of course, there were other strategic factors like India needing Myanmar support um, to address its own North, um, insurgencies in different northeastern states, which share a border with Myanmar, but also um, various economic rationale in terms of, um, um, in, especially in light of India's economic liberalization and the look east policy, which sought to sort of um, enhance economic ties with Southeast Asia. Other dimensions like competing with China in terms of gaining access to oil and gas fields and others sort of um, helped in this policy realignment. What that essentially meant is was that while Western sanctions sort of impeded Myanmar's integration within the larger world economy, um, it sort of um, 
intensified integration within regional economies. It also meant, and this also means that um, Myanmar has an experience of circumventing Western sanctions in the past, um, and perhaps will do um, this time as well. I think the second thing that history sort of teaches us, and um, and also evident in today's circum circumstance in terms of Western engagement in Myanmar, is that while Western states have the interest, they have limited leverage or capacity, and regional actors, regional states have more leverage but limited choice, and because of that limited choice, perhaps limited interest in upturning this political settlement that's sort of dominant, uh, dominated by the Tatmadaw. But I think um, uh, my own assessment of this is um, in reading of the leverage of in, uh, states like India and China on uh, on, uh, on what can they get the Tatmadaw to comply, we're sort of under overestimating their capacity while we're underestimating the agency of the Tatmadaw, who, which has historically leveraged often competing sets of international actors to sustain itself within um, within Myanmar's domestic polity. And of course, there is a lot of um, lo a lot of um, talks about um, if China has sort of supported um, the, um, the Tat uh, Tatmadaw and if, if um, China is interested in sort of promoting some form of authoritarianism um, in Myanmar. But I think it is um, an absence of choice given the geostrategic compulsions um, both for China and India. And uh, um, and the Chinese ambassador has been on record of saying that um, this is not an instance we wanted to see. And um, of course, both India and China have been walking a diplomatic tightrope. Um, it is true that um, it, China is one of the, consistently has been one of the largest investors, um, aid providers, defense and arms suppliers. So it has multiple levers um, that it can use if it wants to get the Tatmadaw to comply with certain um, to, um, to comply to certain political or economic goals, and more so given the overdependence that has been built over decades of sanctions. This has also been fueled further by the in interest that has been shown by regional economies in investing in uh, investing in mining or trade and energy exploration, in which has built um, a web of interdependence with um, Myanmar. But I think it's important to understand this asymmetry of dependence between Myanmar and its regional neighbors is changing. So Myanmar is critical for most of its neighbors. So China's dependence of Myanmar is um, not only for its border securities and its energy needs, but also access to markets, access to the Indian Ocean, especially in light of the Belt and Road Initiative. And while trade and investment for the in, uh, in Myanmar is not a big thing um, for China as a country, it's a lifeline for poor um, provinces like Yunnan. And um, while poor provinces like Yunnan being a policy priority within um, China, especially given given that um, the disparity between coastal and inward inland state provinces in China um, are so important as a public uh, policy debate, um, it is important. So Myanmar becomes quite important. Similarly for India, Myanmar is um, the only land access that India has to different southeastern uh, states. Um, and that's what, and it's accordingly at the heart of two of Indian government's current priorities. It's act east policy as well as its neighborhood first policy. And there's also a range of critical by private sector investments, including uh, groups like Adani, Infosys, um, big groups like that investing in Myanmar. There's also public sector enterprise who have sort of invested a lot, often with um, companies that are owned or have some form of um, shares and stocks by the uh, of the Tatmadaw, like um, the Hindustan Aeronautics Limited or Bharat Dynamics Limited. So to protect the core security and economic interests, um, countries like India and China will have to do, um, engage with any government in power. And um, I know through discussions in China and India that um, sanctions are seen as indulgence um, that only Western states that are far off removed um, from Myanmar's um, geopolitics can afford. Um, I think the Tatmado sort of understands the shifting asymmetry and it's been able to leverage or even barter um, on the country's access to natural resources or it's even its very geography um, to sustain itself um, within the wider political economy. And um, more so, um, there is a, there is an overwhelming concern about overdependence on China. And this overdependence has been ad addressed by porting multiple regional allies from Singapore to different ASEAN states to Russia, which sort of bolsters its um, its autonomy or continues helps continue its autonomy. 
I think the last thing that I wanted to focus on was um, it's not an ideological push where, where China backs of certain um, certain actor in Myanmar, but it's ideological ambivalence that is sort of responsible for its stance right now. And um, I, I think this ideological ambivalence was um, seen um, because of its enthusiastic engagement with the NLD government. Um, even before uh, Aung San Suu Kyi won the elections, she was invited to Beijing. Um, there was a lot of Chinese media uh, reporting about how Aung San Suu Kyi brought in um, domestic popularity and legitimacy that far eclipsed that of the military. So I think, uh, um, there, and this is also complicated by the fact that there is no one China, there are multiple Chinas and Indias uh, working um, on the ground. Um, I think, but I, I think I just want to end uh, for the last one minute by highlighting two couple of uh, two factors where I see that the, there might be some change in terms of the regional response. One is the fact that there is a realization that the state is dysfunctional and even collapsing. Um, so for instance, Chinese funded enterprises have been attacked. And so while the engagement with the military government has been justified to guarantee strategic interests, um, the military's actions are threatening these very strategic interests. So there, it will call for um, a reassessment of the current um, approach. Secondly, not only is the state failing, but it's also marked by weakening of the Taknado and the power shifting away from it. And the recently formed national unity government is an embodiment of that. So as a matter of strategy, secondly, this, um, this putting all of these eggs in the Taknado's basket um, is bound to be rethought. And the Chinese embassy has um, acknowledged that it has spoken to the committee representing the lawmakers from the outstate NLD. And um, I think that so we're witnessing, um, witnessing um, nascent steps towards um, towards a, a more um, reflective strategy that sort of perhaps speaks to um, calls for democracy and calls for human rights. And there's also domestic demands from different pressure groups in India and China, especially states um, in India, we've seen Manipur and Mizoram and uh, others calling to for political um, asylum being given to um, refugees from Myanmar and the like. Um, so I'll stop here, but um, I'm very happy to answer questions as to uh, the shifts and um, what the Western role um, can be um, as we go further. Uh, Dr. Mona Adhikari, thank you so much for that. And I have two immediate questions for you, and I'd like you to give me a nugget of an answer for each of them. Um, the, the pipeline that goes to Yunnan through Myanmar, um, that needs to be secure. So China wants stability in Myanmar. I, I reference it also to the, to the Gwada uh, um, economic corridor through Pakistan, where they're already facing problems similar to those ones, and partic particularly from the Baluchistan separatists. Mm -hmm. um, give me an idea of China's thoughts here of really it would have been in its interest to sort of carry on this process before, because at the moment you've got uncertainty, haven't you? Absolutely, and I think this is this is where China's engagement in fragile states um, becomes uh, has its own shortcomings. So, for instance, um, this ideological ambivalence does not uh, this idea of being politically neutral just does not hold um, in in countries like Myanmar, where authority is so fragmented. So, yes, China wants stability, but I think, like a lot of um, my fa fellow panelists would agree, perhaps agree with me, would be that a long-term sustainable peace perhaps where um, a lot of western actors of very active civil society um is there is not in china's interest but a very stable very short-term stability which kind of protects chinese investments is in china china's interest so um, there there was a U usip report on this and i sort of agree with that um so stability not peace has been sort of the, i think the china's um, and, and, and and another nugget of an answer please is the asean uh, are they neutered on this? Are they have they got any muscle at all? Can they fix it? Can it, the question is is can the region Southeast Asia fix its own problem, or is it going to require the West and bigger actors, as you say, to come in? <clears throat> Um, I think, well, um, I think we need to look at Myanmar is not the only problem in Southeast Asia. So once ASEAN picks up, it's likely to fall back on southern southern Thailand. It's likely to fall, fall back in a lot of other conflicts. So a lot of domestic conflicts are likely to be internationalized if ASEAN is to pick up on Myanmar and sort of um, internationalize that issue within the region. Um, so, yes, but I, I do think that ASEAN might not do it to that extent, but I think it will sort of... It, Perhaps there are a lot of dem domestic pressures within different ASEAN countries that sort of are calling out for the Myanmar uh, Myanmar yeah. situation to be taken up more um, more sincerely. I would think. Mm. 
So it's a domino effect. And, 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 and lastly, because we're going on to the international uh, arena after this, a proxy war, given the Sino-US ratcheting up of tensions, could it become a proxy arena of conflict, whether political or, or, or actually material? Um, I wouldn't use the word proxy war, um, but uh, I would think that there is, there is already a very intense strategic competition with, uh, and we've seen that with uh, with regards to the peace process in Myanmar. So China was wary of different borderlands conflicts like in the Kachin state being internationalized. And there were reports of China saying that they didn't want to see white faces in the borderlands. So there are, there are, there are embodiments of that um, competition, but whether that escalates into a proxy war or not is um, another thing. I think it depend, depends what happens between uh, between Washington and, and Beijing, I suspect. Absolutely. And Myanmar is not the only theater that yeah. they're they're wary of. Yeah, yeah we, we have we have others. Uh, Ukraine we've got over here Absolutely. in another proxy conflict at the moment. But but now we're going to, to broaden it out into the area that we were talking about with Baroness Mary Gowdy, a member of Britain's upper chamber, which we call the House of Lords, and deeply knowledgeable about and involved in global humanitarian issues. Among her many hats, she is director of Vital Voices, which invests in women leaders solving the world's greatest challenges. Uh, Baroness Gowdy is going to tell us about the provision of humanitarian assistance to the people of Myanmar and how the international community can give support, both now and in the long term for a political solution. Baroness Gowdy. Thank you very much. I'm not the director of Vital Voices. I'm a supporter I'm on the European board and ah. was on the international, don't worry. Um, Elise Nelson is the director who, who has done, much, which I will talk about in a moment, has done much to assist in Manama over the last umpteen years with myself and many others. I first, um, became involved in, in, in Manama when it was Burma in 1985, when I had the pleasure to meet Aung Suu Kyi, her children and her husband in Oxford. And from this that day onwards, I have been involved in the uh, whole question of Burma, now Manama. Um, and then when I went into the House of Lords, I joined the, uh, I'd already been involved in the Burma campaign and others and joined that organization and worked very closely um, with our government at that point, when they were helping Aung Suu Kyi to become the leader when she was um, under house arrest, when the government was giving um, assistance through our embassy and the American embassy and trying to give support with other countries. And now let's move on to where we are now. Um, and I think everybody has learned so much from my three colleagues who've spoken earlier um, about how it is. I think the most important thing for us to do and what we have seen thanks to the journalists and international journalists who have been able to get into um, Manama, who have been able to like CNN, Sky and the BBC and other channels who've been able to, to um, take film of, of what's been happening to show to people around the world about the murder, about what's been happening in Cox's Bazaar, about what's been happening on the border on the borders um, and, and where there is nowhere left to go. And the, the, the absolute killing of the Rohingyas and Muslims just without any, any care, that it is almost a genocide. And I feel that very strongly. I feel also that the international um, part, governments need to ask Thailand and Malaysia to assist because otherwise Burma is going to become the next Syria of Asia. You can feel it. Now, the British government has always been a strong supporter of Manama, and we has, as you know, in the past, given strong support to Anne Suu Kyi and, and her whole period. Um, but things changed, as we've seen. And I don't want to go down that road because we're dealing with how we as the international uh, uh, countries can help today. The British government has the chair of the G7 coming up in June and also we have COP26 in November. Also the French have the chair of the G20 and others and the Italians are doing other things. So it is up to all of us to put pressure on our own countries and to lobby through civil society, through members of parliament and through the upper houses to put on pressure that our governments decide how we're going to assist those people in Manama. 
also we have to deal with China because China is supplying them with guns and other forms of, 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 of weapons. And also, as you said, the illicit industries, as we knew in the Afghanistan has kept going for so long with the poppy trade, there is the drugs and illicit drugs in Manama. And so we cannot let this keep go, go by when we see innocent children, women and men are being abused and shot every day. Further, we need to ensure that once we can get peace negotiators to the peace table, that local women have to be part of the, the, those negotiations because it is the local women and local people on the ground know exactly what's happening. They also have to be there for the future of education, investment and health because if those three or four issues are not put into place as part of the peace talks, there is no peace because if you do not have children back at school, opportunities for further education, um, health in terms of maternal health, in terms of male health, all forms of investment from outside and not coming just from one source, we're not going to get the country back on its feet and it's not going to be survive, able to survive alone. So that is what we have to do in terms of putting pressure on the international community. It is not just talking about peace, it's what you get about peace. And that is why it has to be a number of people around the peace table. As you've seen what's happened in, in Afghanistan, the women had to wait outside and they're just about coming in. We know that in Northern Ireland 30 years ago, that it was the women who also, it's one of the few peace agreements that have kept where women actually signed the peace agreement. So it is absolutely vital that the local women at every level amongst local men as well are at those peace tables. And now we have to push pressure on America and Britain in particular, because they really did the business before about trying to get peace there. But if we do not get Thailand and Malaysia and other countries to support this, we are going to be in difficulties um, because the citizens have been stripped of their livelihoods, their shops and homes have been burnt. What are they going to look to if we don't stop this? It's going to be like Syria, which is just going to be a shell. And we saw this on CNN last Sunday when we saw the figures. So what I would like to do today is for people to ask me questions and my other colleagues about how we bring the international community to the table. Gaudi, thank you very much for that. Can I come in with a jump in as, as your... Please, I love Q&A. I mean, I'm really good with, at this. With, with the first question, you, you, mentioned, yes. you mentioned Syria a lot, and I think we've had a lot of experience over the past 20 or 30 years in dealing with very tough regimes uh, who might be morally wrong, but actually have got the muscle. Um, how do we? How do you do this in a different way to say Syria was done, as it were, in that Assad is still in power, the war still continues, the atrocities still continue, as a, a regional or a superpower has come in to help him. Uh, if you can say that um, Myanmar has got the danger of slipping into that, how do you avoid that process uh, where China China or Russia, because the Russian defense minister was in 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 Myanmar just days before the coup, so we don't know what, what transferred there, but, but how do we avoid that this time around? We have to find people on the ground who we can talk to, bring together, and we then have to find international people who will keep talking. I mean, not five minutes, but will sit around the table month after month. We've got to, to get people who prepared and have the acumen of how to do this but that is the only way we're going to and to talk to everyone you've got to talk with, to the, with the door at the table yes because okay. if we don't do this if we don't bring everybody we're not going to get peace yeah yeah absolutely you could i mean we have to bring every religion together yeah you know, every, every grouping together and yeah. they have to work out who but if you don't do that and you also has to be patient and there'll be a lot of talking before you'll even get the first line of peace if we don't do this, we're never going to solve this problem, even for five minutes. Thank you. We now have amongst the questioners a video question, uh, which is on the Rohingya, I think, and something else from Umran Chowdhury. Um, uh, Vinita, are you there? Could we please play the video? Uh, uh, good afternoon. Then... My name is Umran Chowdhury. I am a columnist and a student at the School of Oriental and African Studies in London. 
Uh, my question is regarding the repatriation of Rohingya refugees. Um, will the Myanmar opposition commit to restoring citizenship for the Rohingya refugees? Um, uh, today, many of the uh, forces that were involved uh, in the atrocities on the Rohingya in 2016 and 2017 are now uh, involved in suppressing the pro-democracy movement in Myanmar. Uh, can we expect the plight of the Rohingya to be part of the uh, broader pro-democracy struggle in Myanmar? Thank you. Baroness uh, Gowdy, could, could you give a first first comment on that? Can, can I, just, I couldn't hear quite the last end of the question. What was the last uh, essentially, it was should or will. I mean, because you can't speak for them. Should the opposition mm -hmm. commit to 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 uh, supporting the Rohingyas? Yes, they have to. You know, because you've got to support. You've got to support the Rohingyas. Um, they can't be treated as they're being treated just now. So they have to come to the table. Have to say they're sorry, or 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 or, or, or some. It's always difficult to say you're sorry. So they they have to do this. Um, because the other problem that's going to happen if we don't bring people together, we've seen already that the um, EU have, have started sanctions and people are asking for more sanctions. Um, and that's going to make it more difficult for those yeah. who are there. So, yes, they have to all be at the table. OK, could, could I go to, to, to Thin Lei Win now? Who, um, will the opposition uh, go for this and will it be acceptable? Well... Myanmar society has, like I said, you know, changed dramatically. So I think there's definitely a lot more willingness. You know, people are talking about, oh, we're really sorry about the Rohingya. We really regret it. And I think I should say that Dr. Sasa, who is the representative from the CRPH, you know, and who has now been part of the cabinet announced under the National Unity Government, he has said time and again that there must be justice for the Rohingya sisters and brothers. And he has you know, very publicly spoken about supporting the Rohingya. Um, and I, you know, and I moderated a panel discussion a couple of weeks ago with the, 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 the Rohingya organization in the UK and Dr. Sasa, and he again emphasized the importance of, of having everybody. So, you know, he is definitely saying it. And, you know, like I said, society has changed. Having said that, there are a couple of people um, that are part of the national unity government who had sort of justified um, the uh, atrocities in 2017. And I think it is really important that they need to come out, the cabinet members need to come out and say, we're really sorry about this, or we've changed our minds, you know, that there needs to be some sort of public recognition that what, you know, their previous stance was wrong, and that they will do everything to change that. Okay, th and can, can I finally bring that same question to, to, to Dr. Manzani. Uh, is it a, I mean, it, from what you told us of a few minutes ago, this is going to be a deal breaker, isn't it? So is <clears throat> what is being asked here impossible? No, it is very possible, uh, but it depends very much on whether the Tamado has been overpowered, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> at worst, or completely dismantle uh, at best. The best case scenario is that uh, the public um, is pushing for, uh, not just simply rhetorically, but being in a way that is committed of wanting their sons and daughters, not just sons, daughters, to join what is called federal army. Yeah, And so because, see, you see, Humphrey, what needs to be recognized and appreciated fully is two things. One is, you know, never before has there been a history since independence or even before has the society share a common perspective that the national armed forces has morphed into something utterly and categorically unacceptable, terroristic and fascist like okay. occupier. And the secondly, we have had um, the Burmese equivalent of Black Lives Matter, a radical shift in consciousness where the student unions and public have the openly 
issue their organic apologies to the Rohingyas and the ethnic nationalities that have been subject to the common oppressor, i.e. the National Armed Forces. Okay. And those two things are very, very important yeah. and they give us a basis from which to move forward. So the huge, huge obstacles on the issue of the Rohingyas then, because you've got to actually change the mindset or overthrow uh, the Tadmador. We have uh, Daria Alakani has got a question for Dr. Bremer, who I'll ask to answer first, then Dr. Adhikari, on, on the idea of the, of, the, of the national, of the United Front. Uh, how will that be exploited? I mean, what are the obstacles there of getting that to work? Uh, Dr. Bremer. Muted. There you go. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. If we didn't have a Zoom without somebody being muted, it wouldn't be a real Zoom. So carry on. Yes, please. Absolutely. Um, exploited. Well, maybe if I can rephrase the question. Obviously, the RCSS that you're talking about, Daria, um, is a Shan movement yeah, that hasn't only been fighting against the Tatmadaw, against the military, but also been engaged in armed clashes with other ethnic armed organizations, right? So, for instance, the TNLA. Um, and that, of course, is something that has been fostered in many ways by, you know, years and years of divide and rule strategy by the Tatmadaw that um, ethnic armed organizations um, are often rather fragmented in terms of their strategies and um, having become, you know, have, have become in some ways also um, force on the battlefield rather than allies, etc. So that kind of comes back to this idea of like fostering unity there. We've had several different alliance movements in the history of Myanmar. The most recent was the UNFC, the United, Nation, United Nationalities Federation Council, that incorporated a variety of movements, for instance, the Kachin Independence Organization and the Karen National Union. And that actually fell apart, not least because of, again, that kind of idea of co-opting different movements into the fold of ceasefires of the Tapador, etc. And part of that was actually the nationwide, which was never nationwide, ceasefire agreement that was so ardently supported by um, a lot of donors, but in a way that misunderstood the nature of this, right? Mm -hmm. So what we see at the moment, right, is that the Tapmadaw, of course, does the same thing. Like it actually, and not, I think, for a coincidence, has a strike, uh, has, has, has dealt a ceasefire with um, what was the hottest um, rebellion in the country for the last years, the Arakan army in the west of the country, just before its coup, right? Mm -hmm. um, to nu neutralize that front, because it cannot fight on all fronts at the same time. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, but let's leave it maybe here. But obviously, you know, that's that's a good question there. Yeah. So, so it, 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 it's not just if you took the Tadmador out, which we can't do, there, there would not necessarily be unity because everybody's going to because I mean, they see themselves in a way as the glue that holds the country together. Dr. Adhikari, what are your thoughts on this issue of, uh, of unity? I was just trying to um, echo uh, David here. Um, of course, one of the uh, one of the most um, I think complex um, aspects of Myanmar's peace process has been the sheer multiple uh, multiplicity of ethnic armed movements um, and ethnic armed organizations, um, EOs. And um, I think, um, so not um, given um, the relationship, um, not given the multiplicity of these groups and their own understandings, their own histories, not all of them are likely to join in or show some form of solidarity with the national unity government. But like David said, I think one of the, one of the most overlooked factors um, in, Looking at Myanmar's peace process, but also polity, Myanmar's polity as such, is we often look to look at the relationship between um, the Tatmadaw and different ethnic armed groups, but not so much between the ethnic armed groups themselves. And I think, um, and that's likely to be a key factor in terms of how um, the uh, the divide and rule and um, the exploitation that Daria just mentioned is likely to play out. Okay, so so, yeah, so this is a. Is a is a very tricky one because we've got the Rohingya issue that that, that has to be done. We, we we don't get a sense of unity. And as you were speaking there, uh, I was remembering what Baroness Gaudi comparisons to Syria there, where after ten years of civil war, you don't have a united opposition uh, to challenge Assad at all, despite numerous <clears throat> peace conferences. Uh, Galaxy Dust, that must be <laughs> a pen name, I think. International communities uh, plead China and Russia to stop the bloodshed in Myanmar. Those two can easily do that if they really care. Uh, Dr. Adhikari, can I just come back to you on that to give us a nugget of an answer? Um, yeah, yes. I think um, 
I mean, it really depends on what you, what we think um, is what they care. Like I said, I'm more positive about the shift in terms of um, regional response shifting as as uh, if the the current momentum for of protests and the current uh, unity that is large forms of unity that is seen amongst the Tatmadaws, many opposition. Um, uh, opposition is gone is like will continue i i do think that there will be a shift in terms of at least china's engagement and but this is not uh, this will not be a reorientation based on goals of democracy but rather a very pragmatic assessment based on the shifting dynamics of the ground and largely to largely based on its own security and economic interests so um yes i do i i am more positive about shifting dynamics of, of, of regional uh, interventions can I quickly go to Thin for, for, for a, a thought on that? If Russia and China brokered some form of stability and peace uh, where people are not getting killed and locked up at night, it's not going to be a democracy. What are your thoughts on that? I agree completely with Mona in that I think China will be very pragmatic, but I, I don't really see Russia you know, playing that role. But also I think we can't you know, discount the role regional um, uh, countries, ASEAN can play. We've talked about, you know, Thailand, Malaysia, Singapore is the largest foreign investor in Myanmar. Let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. They can freeze bank accounts and have an impact on some of the, you know, junta families and, you know, businesses quite quickly. So I think, Sure, we can focus on China and Russia, but there's a lot of other countries that need to be pressured and do something as well. Just to, could they freeze as an ASEAN member, could they freeze as an individual state or would it have to be or would it impact their, would they be violating their membership of ASEAN if they did that? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't I don't know that the simplest answer is. But, you know, for a country, I think like Singapore or for Thailand, that actually also has linkages with the US and the UK in terms of banking systems. You know, those two countries have already sanctioned the military uh, company. So I think they can easily sort of say that, oh, because of this international um, um, linkages, we need to be a lot more careful of how we do some businesses that we can't deal with, you know, sanctioned entities. I think that's a, a that's to me that's an easy position to take okay we've got one last question that i want to go around the whole panel with before we come to barry gardner who i see is is back from his parliamentary duties uh this is from oaki one uh, what could be the implication for the future of education in myanmar in the wake of the military coup then give us 30 seconds on that before we move around the panel very bad Okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I left Myanmar in 1998 after three rounds of school closures because the only way I could continue my education was to leave. And I really fear another massive brain drain. Uh, 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 Dr. Zani, um, education, how will that impact the future of Myanmar? Uh, no, not getting doctors. Dr. Zani, are you there? I'm here. It, just give us 30 seconds on your thoughts of the future of education in Myanmar. Well, you, we cannot expect a bright future of education when the entire society is uh, moving in the direction of a all-out zero-sum uh, you know, civil-military conflict. That's just not possible. I don't see. But okay. can... Dr. Brenner, uh, in the in these uh, um, conflict zones where people run their own schools, the future of education. Absolutely, I'm actually doing a whole research project on uh, education in the conflict zones. As you say, there's a lot of it already in uh, uh, the in the non-state areas. But I would just say, of course, it's dire, but it just increases the importance of the non-state educational projects which are in the border areas but also in the center in monasteries to all forms of really progressive initiatives that we've seen and they're so worthy of support right the sense of separation of, of, of that, those identities uh, dr adhikari uh, your, your view on that very interesting question well, I think, uh, like Darren mentioned, um, education cannot be looked at in isolation. It's it's got to be a part of the whole complexity in Myanmar. And and I think one of the things that we could do uh, our part on <clears throat> is also 
um, scaling up very small initiatives like the Mutual Aid um, Myanmar group, which kind of provides lost income support for all the people on the front line protesting. So I think it would help them to sort of protect that education of their children and um, things like that, basic things like that. But I, I don't think education can be looked at in isolation. It's, it's symptomatic of a larger complexity okay. in Myanmar. Thank you. And Baroness Gowdy, um, ed education, but also with your specific hat, uh, the, the, the education of women um, or, or girls, how, how is that going to be impacted and what does it need to be? It is It is impacted now and it has to be that education of, of boys and girls and women has to be part of any peace project, whether it's small or big. And in the meantime, well, we can get funding to specific groups, this has to be done. Because if we don't have education, there is no future for the country. And, also, and we've already uh, lost a, a general. We, we're about to lose a possibly a generation, generation, aren't generation of, of yes. education of knowing how It's not the place for everybody to be educated in either. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. We're now going to move to uh, Barry Gardner, who's returned, thankfully, from his parliamentary duties, uh, to sum up uh, what he's heard, the themes, and to give us his his. Um, in conclusions to this debate. Barry, over to you. Well, Humphrey, thank you. And, and first of all, my apologies to David and to Mona. Uh, I only heard the first part of, of David's uh, contribution and the last part of Mona's. So, so please forgive me if I, if I uh, don't pick up on things that, that were critical to your, your contributions. Um, look, where are we? <laughs> We are between a fallen angel and the devil himself, um, it seems to me, when, when looking at Myanmar. Um, the, we started today with um, Lord Bruce talking about how the Tatmadaw have, have miscalculated international opinion. I wonder whether they have. Um, I'm not sure that international opinion is going to be able to percolate this in the way that Mary and I agree with you Mary I, I would love to see but I I just doubt that there is the strength of purpose to make it happen um, one of the things that that I, I really enjoyed about Thin Lai Win's contribution was was that phrase that she put in nor I might add when she said, nor I might add, when she was talking about um, journalists not being respected by the junta, she said, nor I might add, by the de democratically elected government when it was uh, in control. Um, and she also talked about the creativity of the young generation. And I think there is something significantly different from, from previous clampdowns, and that is that this generation has had much greater experience of freedom and in particular the internet than in, on previous occasions in the past. And I, I don't know about some of you, but I was certainly struck by um, the signs that some of the uh, protesters were putting up, which were really very witty. Um, uh, one of them, I thought, was 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 particularly adept in in its its use of language. It said, "My ex is bad, my Anmar military is worse." Um, and here you've got a generation which is incredibly media savvy. Um, they've also used some some language that I wouldn't <laughs> wish to share with you. Um, are blank, here we go again, um, and you've blanked with the wrong generation. But what this is showing, I think, is a much greater awareness of how to internationalize their protest. Um, and despite all that we heard from Thin about the, the clamp down, the penal code 505, the way in which um, there's been the, the blackouts and, and the restrictions, um, they are getting that message across in, in a very contemporary way. Um, Mong Zani talked about um, reframing 
the need to reframe the constitution and the military. And I, I think it was really important that he focused as he did on the Tatmadaw um, and didn't simply see it as, uh, as uh, only in control of military, because of course, um, it controls not just defense, but home affairs, border affairs, and it has the levers of economic power. Um, and that's something that I think was well brought out in, in the latest um, uh, UN Human Rights Council report, um, where they talk about um, the private companies with officials who have, may have made a substantial and direct contribution to the commission of crimes under international law, including the crimes against humanity and other inhumane acts. They talk about um, all the, the ways in which um, the Tatmadaw's economic power um, is being used, 6.15 million US dollars, um, from 45 companies um, that were solicited by senior Tatmadaw leadership in support of the clearance operations that began against the Rohingya in Rakhine, Rakhine province. So what you see is a military that is really a, a kleptocracy and um, that has embedded its control through the economic heights of the economy um, and that is sucking those to maintain um, the, the power base that they have. And again, I thought it was significant that so many times in different presentations, people talked about marriages, marriages of convenience. Um, uh, Thin did it, Mwang did it, Mo, Mo, Mona did it as well. Um, and I think, David, you did also. Um, but the way in which nationalism, ethnic nationalism, and economic control and military power have been consolidated. And it's, when I say, start off by saying, we're between a fallen angel and the devil himself here, um, I really welcomed the clarity with which some of our, our, our presenters spoke this afternoon about uh, how the regime uh, under Aung San Suu Kyi, had not been um, a democratic, enlightened regime as so many of us in the West believed it to be. Um, and I thought it was really important when he made the distinction, when Mang made the distinction between the institutional and not the personal, um, that she had seen this in personal terms. And what's needed here is a change in the institution. Now, David's map, I found uh, a revelation. I'm not a, a, an expert in, in, in Myanmar. And I found that really fascinating to see just how many conflicts uh, there are, how many armed groups fighting for greater autonomy exist in Myanmar. And, and that, I'm afraid, doesn't give me hope. Because when, at the end, people were talking about how does one achieve unity, um, well, unity is very easy to achieve if you're fighting against a common enemy. Um, but achieving a sense of national unity when you have so many different groups that are trying to assert their own identity uh, and you have a very strong ethnic nationalism at the core, the, the fascistic nationalism uh, that was talked of, that is really, really difficult to see a way through here. And when people talk about, well, you know, China, Russia, um, I think one of the contributors, um, the, the questioners from, from, from today's audience said, if they really care, then China and Russia could do something. Well, what do they care about here? Um, and what do we care about here? What can we do? Um, you know, at the deck, at the center of China's foreign policy for decades has been that principle that they don't interfere in other countries' internal affairs. Um, we could do more in the UK, I, I, I've no doubt. Uh, I think, you know, we could look to restrict um, certain items. Uh, we could 
block the import of rubies and jade from Myanmar, uh, trades that the country's military uh, Tatmadaw are deeply embedded in, in the mining industry as well. So um, there are other things that we could do. Are they going to be e effective? Are they actually going to change the situation? Um, I, I suspect that is, is for another day. Um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, uh, I'm not a pessimist by nature, I'm an optimist. Um, but I suppose here I'm an optimist that sees no rational basis for his optimism, unless it be in what Thin spoke of at the beginning. And that is the way in which this generation is able to respond. Thank you. Um, sort of reflected what um, what I was thinking then. Um, particularly, I, I, I'm going to stretch just by one minute. I, I just because we've had these references to Syria, and we've had the talk about China and Russia and these uh, other countries getting in, and no unity. Mm. It's it, Myanmar's not going to end up like Syria, is it, Barry? I I think. Comparisons always break down if you push them too hard. And, and I think it, it's, it's probably not instructive to think of it as a, as a proto-Syria. I think it's, it, it's important that we look at the conditions here um, and, and see what interventions the international community can make, what interventions will actually have an effect on changing things on the ground um, and you know when when we were talking about the, the personal or the institutional I, I just wonder um, that given that the the leader of the coup um, actually saw his own career coming to an end um, because he had to leave the military in July that that's uh, uh, under the military rules he, he would have to retire um, and he would have lost his position as a response, uh, as a result of that. I just wonder how much the personal actually came back to the fore yeah, in really. his need to maintain personal control through the military, which he would no longer be able to do, and therefore a coup was precipitated on that basis. That's very, very good inside point, really, that doesn't get through. But thank you, Barry, for that. And, and thank you, everybody. And do subscribe all of you out there to uh, Asian Affairs magazine, which really does get under the skin of Asian issues. Uh, there's material in here that you will not read in any other publication. Our next Democracy Forum debate is on May the 19th, Bangladesh, 50 years on from liberation war to the nucleus of South Asia. Um, it's been a fascinating debate. I can't say that I've come away pessimistic, but with more realism. And this idea, I think, that Barry and several of the panel mentioned, uh, do what can be impactful, do something that can actually work, as opposed to, as we have many times before, done something that satisfies our Western electorate uh, back home. Uh, thank you, Lord Bruce, uh, Thin Lei Win, Dr. Manzani, Dr. David Brenner, Dr. Mona Adhikari, and Baroness Mary Gowdy, and Barry Gardner, uh, and for making it back, Barry, and for all of you out there, thank you for coming, and good luck, and stay safe. Thank you.